Hello everyone. Welcome to my channel, A Jane Night Sews. I'm so pleased to be here and speak to you to two of my about two of my research interests that I love to mesh together, Jane Austen's historical time period and her novels, and the history of jewelry and gemstones. I had so much fun researching and reading into Mrs. Elton's Pearls, a very close reading you could call it, and I hope you enjoy the results. Throughout this presentation, I'll show you visuals of royal pearls and portraits, pictures of historical pearl jewelry, and fashion plates illustrating the use of pearls during the early 19th century. So let's get started. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. All right, so here are a couple of film versions of Mrs. Elton showing off her pearls. As objects of display, pearls have historically signaled aristocratic status, legitimized authority, and constituted visual reassurances of the wearer's personal worth. Pearls have also traditionally signaled an array of positive attributes, including purity of soul, modesty, and the ideal woman. Pearls depicted in royal portraiture of English queens demonstrated the sovereign's majestic excellence or satirically represented luxurious excess. In Emma, Mrs. Elton wears pearls as regalia of supremacy to elicit esteem from and assert her delusion of superiority within the social structure of Highbury. Yet her pearls work against her to expose her futile attempts at elegance as she continually reveals herself to be the opposite. The dissonance created when Mrs. Elton wears pearls, wears pearls, but behaves inappropriately is further emphasized by her dictatorial treatment of Jane Fairfax, who does exemplify several symbolic attributes of pearls. By giving Mrs. Elton pearls, Jane Austen dramatizes the generational gap in the cultural meanings of the gems and their shift from viable markers of, nobil of nobility, of birth, towards emblems of extravagance. So at Emma, the pearls become evidence of the conspicuous consumption of an unrefined member of the nouveau riche mounting an incursion through her forward ways on the social codes and conventions of the land owning gentry and revealing contemporary social anxieties surrounding what Juliet McMaster calls, quote, the assaults on the gentility of the new mercantile middle class, unquote. This presentation will examine the social politics of pearls in Austin's Emma. In the larger historical context, in order to shed greater light on the novel's concerns about the transgression of class boundaries in Regency England. I think this pendant with its glorious moonstones and peridot surrounded by tiny seed pearls is mesmerizing and whoever was wearing it could certainly be the center of attention. We have no descriptions of Mrs. Elton's jewelry in the novel, but this would have been within the scope of her financial abilities. Mrs. Elton asserts her assumed sovereignty over Highbury through her visual markers of wealth, an ostentation that garners her no friends among the discerning members of this country's society. Emma Woodhouse, in response to the new Mrs. Elton's clear attempts to jostle for rank, observes her competitor to be, quote, a little upstart vulgar being with airs of pert pretension and underbred finery. Unquote. The less suspicious Miss Bates called Mrs. Elton, quote, quite the queen of the evening, unquote, at the Crown Ball, and it, an apt description of her self-important, officious manner toward her, quote, inferior, to use Mrs. Elton's word to describe Miss Jane Fairfax. The ball presents this usurper queen with the opportunity to flaunt her position through dress, a preeminence she pointedly verbalizes to Jane when she says, quote, nobody can think less of dress in general than I do, but upon such an occasion as this, when everybody's eyes are so much upon me, and in compliment to the Westons, 
who I have no doubt are giving this ball chiefly to do me honor, I would not wish to be inferior to others, and I see very few pearls in the room except mine. In culminating her effort to extract attention from her captive audience by calling attention to her preponderance of pearls, Mrs. Elton emphasizes their importance to her as markers of her superiority. Her ornaments and conversation appear straight out of Jean Roquet's 1755, The Present State of the Arts in England. He writes, you try everything that is capable of procuring a little homage to our dear individual, even if it be extorted. The brilliancy and value of jewels is one of the surest means of adding something to the importance of our being. They proclaim us from afar, they extend, as it were, the limits of our existence." Unquote. Mrs. Elton wears pearls to extort, extort uh, admiration from her Highbury subjects. And when Jane is not suitably complimentary, Mrs. Elton verbally reminds her of her superiority. She takes advantage of the, quote, common politeness and good breeding of other characters, particularly Jane, to construct herself as the pearl-coated queen of Highbury. Austen's depiction of Mrs. Elton and her pearls is one example of the relationship between the novel and a cultural controversy. The 18th and 19th century uh, debate over the rise and status of members of the mercantile middle class based on wealth without merit. The use of pearls and other gems to display pecuniary and royal power was an enduring tradition, but these significations were contested in 18th and 19th century England and in its novels uh, and manners of taste and prodigality constituting pearls and other jewels as sites of class conflict. Mrs. Elton's appropriation of pearls as an aristocratic symbol of worth places the novel in dialogue with cultural patterns of class status and its material markers. I argue that Mrs. Elton uses her pearls as one mechanism for the display of her power and mobility within Highbury society, and that her social disappointments reveal unresolved social conflicts, as well as constraints upon the efforts of the merchant class to penetrate the upper echelons of 19th century English society. Historically, in many cultures, including ancient Rome and Elizabeth Elizabethan England, pearls were considered rare and most prized of gems. English women desired the pearls they wore to signify their nobility and none so much as English queens. Every Tudor, Stuart, and Hanoverian queen from Caroline or Catherine of Aragon to Jane Austen's contemporary Queen Charlotte is depicted with pearls in official paintings constituting their predominance over their subjects through the spectacle and symbolism of the jewels. What Marsha Poynton calls the semiotics of luxury, uh, after all, as Poynton states, the idea of royal femininity and that of jewelry appear to be inseparable. A queen stripped of her jewels is no longer identifiable as separate and different from the common mortal. In this slide, you can see portraits of Henry VIII's queen consorts. In the top row uh, from the left to right are Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, and in the bottom row we have Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. Lots of Catherines. Jane Seymour and the last two Catherines even appear to be wearing altered versions uh, of the same pearl necklace, perhaps connoting the recycled and refurbished nature of their position as Henry's wife. No matter how tenuous and ultimately life-threatening this position was for most of them, the pearls in each portrait are meant to mark their station as royal. Here you can see two portraits of Henry VIII's eldest daughter, Mary Tudor as a princess in 1544 on the left, and as Queen of England in 1554 on the right. Catherine Parr, Henry's last queen, was instrumental in getting him to pass the Third Succession Act, 
of 1542, which restored Mary Tudor and Elizabeth Tudor uh, to the line of succession. Otherwise, Elizabeth never would have been queen. The large pearl-shaped, uh, pear-shaped pearl, sorry, dangling from her brooch pendant in her portraits is thought to possibly be La Peregrina, or the Pilgrim or Wanderer, given to Mary by her suitor and eventual husband, Philip II of Spain. However, Mary is seen wearing a similar jewel in a much earlier portrait, and there is other conflicting information about the pearl's provenance. If it is La Peregrina, the pearl itself is famous and was most recently owned by the late Elizabeth Taylor. Either way, the modest and pious Catholic queen did not up the ante much in her jewelry after becoming queen, but her sister Elizabeth Tudor certainly did. All right, here we again, here again are two portraits of the same woman. You probably recognize her. One in her youth is a princess and the other is queen. Princess Elizabeth's portrait is comparable to her sister Mary's in terms of jewelry, yet the portrait on the right, known as the Armada portrait, because it commemorates the English defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, depicts the royal body encrusted in pearls uh, in her hair, in her headpiece, her necklaces, and sewn into her gown. The pearls are evidence of her power, the power she bestowed upon her country that enabled her people to defeat, defeat the Spanish and the virginal purity from which it flowed. Royal portraits of Elizabeth I are drenched in the iconography of pearls in general, resonating with her status as the Virgin Queen of England. And here are two more. On the left is the Pelican portrait, and on the right, the Rainbow portrait. Her preference for pearls con contributed uh, to her posthumous label, the Pearl Queen, and the early modern period in Europe became known as the Pearl Age in deference to her gems, uh, the gem's supreme popularity. The significance of pearls in queenly portraits was hegemonic in that it constituted what Raymond Williams describes as, quote, a set of meanings and values which as they are experienced as practices appear as reciprocally confirming, unquote. In other words, the queens wore pearls because they were royal, of royal blood and they were of royal blood because they were the ones wearing so many pearls. It is clear from Queen Elizabeth's portraiture that she believed in the ability of her pearls to protect her queenliness. Move this if I can. There we go. Maybe not. Go up there. Okay. Um, where was I? Even prints from engravings depicted her with her pearls, as seen here. However, the continued rise of the merchant class in early modern England meant more people could afford pearls, making their distribution harder to control. The ensuing threat of dilution of pearl symbolic, symbolic significance contributed to Queen Elizabeth and her parliament strengthening existing sumptuary laws uh, to continue uh, to curb the purchase and display of luxuries like pearls under the auspices of encouraging subjects to buy more useful items like horses. And leave the pearls to the queens, please. The effect, however, was to preserve the visual differentiation between the classes and the hegemonic iconography of pearls, and thus to reinforce the social hierarchy. Although sumptuary laws were almost never enforced, at least that I could find evidence for, in part because the nobility could not control everyone's choices and purchases or attire every day, the royal portraiture indicates the continuing subscription of, to the aristocratic iconography of pearls in queenly superiority. Eh, there we go. Here you can see examples of portraiture depicting English consorts following the Pearl Queen. From left to right, we have here Anne of Denmark, Henrietta Maria of France, Catherine of Braganza, and Mary of Modena. None of these royal ladies are depicted with quite the plethora of pearls, 
uh, that we see with Elizabeth I, and that is in part due to changing taste, but it is also important to rem or remember that Elizabeth was queen in her own right, not a queen consort. She could wear as many pearls as she wanted to. As the royal head of state in a woman's body, rather than a queen consort, whose job it was to give birth to royal progeny, Elizabeth had to constantly prove her legitimacy and power as sole sovereign, and the enormous numbers of pearls helped. In this slide, you can see that uh, pearl jewelry, at least, is relatively scarce. Relatively. Queen Anne is depicted in the portrait on the left, and I have yet to find one of her in which she is wearing a necklace. <laughs> she was also a queen in her own right, although she was married throughout her reign. On the right is Queen Caroline, wife of George II. She wears most of her pearls on her sleeves and bodice in this portrait. Okay. Here you can see, um, finally we reach the English queen who is Jane Austen's contemporary, Queen Charlotte, wife of George III. Yay, in the Georgian era. In a print from an engraving of her marriage portrait on the right, okay, her pearls dominate the imagery and she remained enamored of these jewels all her life. In fact, she acquired quite a bit of personal jewelry in addition to the British crown jewels. Um, and, and the Christie's catalog dating from July 1819, eight months after her death, includes quite a few of her pearly personal effects up for auction. Among these items are earrings, bracelets, brooches, buckles, and a purse, but the most prevalent items are the necklaces, at least six of them containing a total of 780 individual pearls. The public discerned the royal excess of pearls and pearls began to resonate with conflicting meanings of excellence and extravagance. In the political landscape of socioeconomic inequality and suspicion of monarchies leading up to the French Revolution in the late 18th century, Queen Charlotte and George III were mocked for their miserliness and love of money and the queen for her excessive consumption of diamonds and pearls. The queen was frequently depicted wearing her pearls in unflattering political cartoons, including the two on the side, and thus the cartoons contest the gems as signifiers of royal excellence. And Emma often relies on the shift in pearl signification to present Mrs. Elton as a woman worthy of the characterist's scorn. Mrs. Elton adopts the royal cultural practice of a, a superfluity of pearls and points out her visible difference to Jane, Jane Fairfax, in order to accrue the civility she feels are due to her as Jane's social superior. Okay. Mrs. Elton is not an aristocrat, but a member of a demographic, a demographic gaining dominance in England during the 19th century, the Nouveau Riche. Emma, a member of the landed gentry, contemplates Mrs. Er, Mr. Elton's speedily acquired new bride, Augusta Hawkins, before her arrival to Highbury. What she was must be uncertain, but who she was might be found out. And setting aside the 10,000 pounds, it did not appear that she was at all Harriet's superior. She brought no name, no blood, no alliance. Miss Hawkins was the youngest of the two daughters of a Bristol merchant, of course, he must be called, but as the hold of the profits of his mercantile life appeared so very moderate, it was not unfair to guess the dignity of his line of trade had been very moderate also. Emma focuses on the fine gradations of social status before judging the character or manners of Mrs. Elton. It is only after she meets Mrs. Elton that she thinks her self-important, presuming, familiar, ignorant, and ill-bred. Mrs. Elton's failure to gain the honest regard she desires and attempts to extort through her finery from important members of the Highbury gentry signals the novel's discomfort with the fluidity of social uh, positions in the new economic order 
following the industrial breakthroughs of the 1770s and the fall of the aristocracy in France, as well as an anticipation of the Industrial Revolution, which was getting going. The use of luxury such as jewelry for purposes of social aspiration therefore constitute what constitutes what Alastair Duckworth calls a vicious use of riches, implying moral inferiority in characters like Mrs. Elton. Marcia Poynton argues that pearls and other gems that had once communicated transcendent values over distances of time and place ceased to have that capacity as they became debased in their use in public by the lower classes, her words, not mine. In other words, their social resonance became muted. Members of the peerage reacted against this democratization of jewelry and by implication, the usurpation of gems as markers of superiority. Works such as Lord Kane's Elements of Criticism, published in 1762, according to Clinton, associate the acquisition of superb and gorgeous things with an appetite for superiority and respect inflamed by riches. Articulating a moral economy of possessions and appearances, women's etiquette manuals of the early 19th century cautioned women against wearing excessive jewelry or other finery in order to maintain propriety, decorum, and civility. Mrs. Elton's assertion of her social power through her pearls therefore represents her vulgarity, um, <laughs> which uh, she's brief. Okay, and questionable morality, and thus a negative consequence of social mobility based on wealth in Austin's England. I just love um, this ring. As members of the nobility chastised their inferiors for the overuse of jewelry and the monarchy held fast to the iconography of pearls, various 18th century texts revealed a widespread identification with jewelry as a signifying system understood to be universal and timeless. Ironically, women's scrupulous and subtle use of pearls was emblematic of the gem status as signifiers of purity innocence, humility, and a retiring spirit, in essence, symbolizing the ideal woman. Here are a few fashion plates with examples of a relatively modest use of pearls. They are, they are all evening dresses, and as you can see, the pearls are mostly relegated to necklaces, bodices, and headgear. As for the symbolism of the pearls, neither signification, royal superiority, nor a modest humi humility works for Mrs. Elton. As a member of the mercantile class, Mrs. Elton misuses pearls to extort deference from her Highbury neighbors, an illustration of what Bill Brown describes as, quote, deploying material goods on behalf of a political agenda, unquote, and one that is ultimately unsuccessful. Therefore, the pearls' failure to help fulfill Mrs. Elton's desires for social superiority exemplifies the obsolescence of the gems as signifiers of nobility within the context of class mobility in England. More pearly fashion plates. I found so many of these, it was, it was really hard to decide which ones to put on um, the presentation. All right, so Austin's uh, characterization with it. Again, these are all evening dresses. We never read uh, of Mrs. Elton wearing pearls during the day. So at least she got that right. But her use of pearls is still questionable. Her relationship to her pearls is an example of, according to Brown, quote, how inanimate objects constitute human subjects, how they move them, how they threaten them, how they facilitate or threaten their relation to other subjects, unquote. Despite her desire that her pearls will constitute her as superior, they instead signify her vulgarity and her frivolous obsession with dress, threatening her relationships with characters subjected to that excess. Used in a manner contrary to custom, i.e. to signify royalty or modest humility, Mrs. Elton's pearls only bring disappointment. 
This attenuation of the signifying potency of pearls highlights the novel's recasting of the gems to question the rampant transgression of class boundaries brought on by new wealth in Austin's cultural moment. Yeah. Here we go. So Austin's characterization of the novels, uh, I love these images by the way, a vulgar self-appointed sovereign parallels her portrayal of the Pearl Queen, Elizabeth, in her farcical The History of England, written in 1791 when Austen was only 15. If you haven't read it, please do. It is hilarious. She describes Elizabeth as, quote, that disgrace to humanity, that pest of society, unquote, much as a reader might imagine Emma in one of her unguarded moments describing Mrs. Elton. The correspondences between the two works become even stronger in consideration of the relationships between the queens, Elizabeth and Mrs. Elton, and their subjects, Mary Queen of Scots and Jane Fairfax. Mrs. Elton's delusion of superiority in Emma bleeds in her, into her iniquity in her officious treatment of the elegant Jane Fairfax because she tries to force Jane into a governess position. In parallel, Queen Elizabeth, Austen writes, was, quote, the destroyer of all comfort, the deceitful betrayer of trust reposed in her by her cousin, Mary, who, quote, had every reason to expect assistance and protection from Elizabeth when she was in trouble. Instead, Elizabeth's, quote, wicked and illegitimate rule brought, quote, this amiable woman uh, to an untimely, unmerited, and scandalous death." Unquote. In her illustrations for her sister's writing, Cassandra Austin highlights the discrepancy in Elizabeth and Mary's moral qualities, manners, and social power. Elizabeth, on the left, is caricatured as uh, unattractive and appears to have a large pearl dangling from her breast. Maybe it's a diamond, but it's more likely a pearl. Elizabeth was only nine years older than Mary, although she looks at least twice that in the image. <laughs> uh, the same illustrations could be used to represent Mrs. Elton and Jane Fairfax. Um, Austin's two works, separated though they are in time and maturity, create a connection between the wearing of pearls and questionable, even tyrannical behavior. Now in the book, uh, Augusta Hawkins and Jane Fairfax are also not that far apart in age, but they are portrayed in the same manner. Although Mrs. Elton does not have Jane murdered, she very nearly destroys her autonomy. Jane is a financially dependent woman from a good family without living parents and to avoid poverty, uh, the poverty her aunt Miss Bates experiences, she must take the, as described by Linda Hall, quote, life-defining choice between selling herself in the marriage market or the governess trade, end quote. Mrs. Elton notices Jane's beauty and skill in music, yet she never regards her as having any marital prospects. Um, instead, she becomes Jane's overly active patroness, attempting to bring her, quote, magnificent intentions, unquote, to fruition. A, government, a governess job for Jane is preferable to Mrs. Elton because if Jane were to get married, her, her economic status could rise above Mrs. Elton's, whom she already surpasses in manners and beauty. Mrs. Elton likes Jane because despite her elegance and beauty, she is lower on the social ladder than the rich vicar's wife. After leaving her wealthy friends, the Campbells, Jane, according to Mrs. Elton, quote, is now in such retirement, such obscurity, so thrown away, and I think she feels it. I'm sure she does. She's very timid and silent. I like her the better for it. I must confess it is a recommendation to me. I am a great advocate of timidity and I am sure she, one does not often meet with it, but in those who are at all inferior, it is extremely prepossessing." Unquote. In short, Mrs. Elton prefers Jane's inferior position and polite deference to Emma's wealth, silent snubs, and affronting disagreement. Mrs. Elton's imperial behavior towards Jane 
begins in earnest during the party at Parkfield when she, as authoritarian and, quote, elegant as lace and pearls could make her, unquote, insists on having her servant bring Jane her mail under the auspices of maintaining her health. In reality, it is more a show of her social superiority. Mrs. Elton's officious patronage infantilizes Jane, painting her as a child incapable of making her own decisions and therefore encroaches on her autonomy. She fails to bend Jane to her will though, and thus, and thus brushes up against the limits of her own social power. Mrs. Elton's attempt to restrict Jane's movements parallels the villainous Queen Elizabeth's imprisonment of the innocent Mary. Both subjects in Austen's narrations should have been able to trust their supposedly noble superiors. Mrs. Elton's efforts to suppress Jane socially culminate in her determination to help Jane find work as a governess. She professes to be Jane's friend, insisting that she is affected by what she considered to be her pitiable situation and vowing to do everything in her power to help. However, Mrs. Elton's altruism is suspicious because of her denigration of Mrs. Weston, because she was formerly Emma's governess. That's what she thinks of governesses. Mrs. Elton tells the astonished Emma, quote, having understood as much, I was rather astonished to find her so very ladylike. But she really is quite the gentlewoman, unquote. Her own impolitic manner, social prejudice against governesses, and doubts as to their gentility cast her later charitable intentions into doubt as she pushes Jane towards what she herself considers a degrading situation and social position. She looks down on genteel working women and elevates herself by comparison. Mrs. Elton also uses her social power over Jane to negotiate her relationship with Emma, the reigning queen of Highbury. After Emma expresses doubt about Jane's need of assistance, Mrs. Elton corrects her, constructing an imaginary unity with Emma in both financial resources and social standing in Highbury, regaling her with their similarities. Mrs. Elton proposed, Mrs. Elton's proposed philanthropic so-called guidance is rebuffed, along with the illusion that she and Emma are equals. Mrs. Elton plans for Jane are both a reaction to Emma's social rejection and a form of vengeance intended to display Mrs. Elton's superior social influence. Her meddling in Jane's affairs is in fact a parody of Emma's interference in Harriet Smith's life. But whereas Emma evolves throughout the novel and realizes her mistake in pursuing the self-gratifying task of finding Harriet an eligible husband, Mrs. Elton attempts to force Jane into paid servitude in order to keep her in a lower social station and to flaunt her social advantage to Emma. The confrontation between Mrs. Elton's tyranny and Jane's polite opposition intensifies when Mrs. Elton tries to coerce Jane into agreeing to look for governess positions directly. This coercion is colored by immorality because the Hawkinses Hawkins, association with slavery and the associ association of pearls with forced labor. In response to Mrs. Elton's pressure, Jane replies, quote, there are places in town offices where inquiry would soon produce something, offices for the assail, not quite of human flesh, but of human intellect, unquote. Mrs. Elton then reveals her anxiety about her place of origin, Bristol a port city important to the English slave trade and her family's possible involvement with it. She says, quote, you quite shock me. If you mean a fling at the slave trade, I assure you Mr. Suckling was always rather a friend to the abolition, unquote. Given Mrs. Elton's Bristol connections and her maiden name Hawkins, Jane Austen's contemporary readers would have made the association with the 16th century Sir John Hawkins the first successful British slave trader. Mrs. Elton's pearls were also a possible link to slavery or at the very least colonial exploration. In the early 19th century, most pearls in England were imported from its colonies. 
including parts of the Arabian Peninsula and also Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka. In the case of Ceylon, the colonizers took advantage of its people and uh, pearl fisheries, exhausting the latter within decades. It is therefore reasonable to assume that Mrs. Elton's pearls were derived from forced labor, uh, further marking her self-assumed authority over Jane, semiotically represented by the pearls as iniquitous. Jane responds by stating that, quote, governess trade, I assure you, was all that I had in view, widely different, certainly, as to the guilt of those who carry it on. But as to the greater misery of the victims, I do not know where it lies, unquote. This is, of course, ridiculous, and slaves had it much worse than governesses, uh, but it shows you how she feels about being a governess. And uh, I think we could talk a lot more about that conversation between Jane Austen, or I'm sorry, Jane Fairfax and Mrs. Elton, but that's a later talk. Jane clearly equates the loss of autonomy and equality inherent in the paid servitude of a governess, as well as the mortification of working for members of one's own class to slavery, problematic. However, her implication is lost on the cheerfully forceful Mrs. Elton, who continues to be quite serious about finding Jane a governess post. Without acknowledging Jane's desires or wishes, Mrs. Elton relishes her social power to find Jane a proper situation. Her social power over Jane is instilled by riches possibly de derived through the depravity of the slave trade. Thus, her use of pearls to exert this power illustrates her relationship to Jane as that between a slave trader and a slave, or between a villainous queen and her subject. Pearls can represent the modest humility and grace of the ideal woman and in their material reality constitute a luminous and layered subtlety. In opposition to Mrs. Elton, Jane Fairfax emulates the symbolic and material qualities of pearls. This contrast highlights the novel's protest against equating financial wealth to social superiority and its validation of internal worth instead. Mrs. Elton's naked materialism and obvious insufferability belie the symbolic alignment between her and her pearls. Emma's opinion of the only known wearer of pearls in the novel is that, quote, that she meant to shine and be very superior, but with manners which had been formed in a bad school, hurt and familiar, unquote. Mrs. Elton is rather more like gaudy costume jewelry, visually assaulting people in, with her finery, annoying them with her self-congratulatory loquacity, and giving herself undeserved airs of social authority over the will of others. The slippage of the Pearl's ability to signify Mrs. Elton's character is supported by Edward Copeland's reading of Emma, which argues that, quote, consumer signs are often false and misleading. And instead, the character that characters should be judged by the real signs of social behavior. Copeland insists that Austen's novel is a reaction to major social change, fueled in some degree by the very goods that set themselves up as signs of social truth. In contrast to Mrs. Elton's transparency, the beautiful and accomplished Jane is presented as a mystery in the novel, like the opacity of pearls. These eye miniatures surrounded by pearls are the most often, uh, were most often given as love tokens and the identity of the owner of the eye and therefore also the lover. Can you stop that kitty? Okay, where was I? <laughs> uh, would not be apparent, emulating in a way Jane's secret engagement to Frank Churchill. And Emma's mistaken supposition of her affair with Mr. Dixon. Soon after Jane arrives in Highbury, Emma chafes at her coldness and reserve, although Mr. Knightley says what arises from discre discretion must be honored. Although uh, uh, okay. Emma continues to suspect such extreme and perpetual cautiousness of word and manner, even Jane's complexion resembles that of a pearl. Oh my gosh, the blinds, okay. She is naturally so pale, certainly never brilliant, and there was a softness and delicacy in her skin, which gave peculiar elegance to the character of her face, unquote. Like the natural iridescent smoothness of pearls. 
In addition to her excellent education, Jane Fairfax is intrinsically elegant. She is the true pearl of the novel. Mrs. Elton's pearls are symbols of societal anxiety over the blurring of class boundaries within the rise of the merchant class. In Emma's nuanced distinctions between the middling classes and the representative characters' negotiations, failures, and successes in staking out their relative ranks, Emma constitutes an utterance in the system of class discourse. Maybe if I move over here. Ooh, okay. The contested signification of pearls as authorizing social power or representing luxury in excess is one example of what Frederick, Frederick Jameson calls the antagonistic dialogue of class voices with their irreconcilable demands and differences in the novel. The pearls are an example of, to again use Jameson's words, the tradition annihilating effects of the spread of a money and market economy with the changing cast of characters who are continually in opposition. The end of the novel rewards Jane and Emma for the, their sincerely good manners, Emma eventually, indicative of their excellence of heart, with marriage to their desired mates. Upon hearing a description of Emma's wedding, Mrs. Elton, though, quote, thought it all extremely shabby and very inferior to her own. Very little white satin, very few lace veils, a most pitiable business, unquote. She may have her pearls, lace, and so many servants she cannot remember their names, but she has been rejected from attendance at the wedding ceremony, rejected from particular friendships with the Highbury elites, and completely displaced as the self-appointed queen of Highbury. Emma therefore questions social class and power based on wealth particularly in the absence of higher qualities of mind and men. Thank you so much for listening and watching. I hope that if you have any questions, you will comment down below. And uh, it was so fun to do this research and my other talks on this channel are also combining my literary studies with my studies of gems uh, and geology. So I hope you enjoy those too. Thank you so much and goodbye.